Welcome to Lick Wake, San Francisco's literary festival. I'm Jack Bower, the co-founder of Lick Wake, and we are streaming live to you from the Bay Area and around the world. This is our 21st festival, and obviously we are virtual this year, and um, our schedule runs through October 24th, so um, we have plenty of events coming up. You can catch all the details at lickquake.org. Today, I was going to say tonight, but actually we're in the daytime here in uh, the West Coast. We are honored to be able to present Bridget Quinn celebrating release of her new book, She Votes, in conversation with Nell Irvin Painter and Tabitha Soren. A few quick uh, details before we begin. Um, please feel free to ask the group your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to your questions in the second half of the event. Afterwards, you'll be um, asked to fill out a very short survey. We we uh, beg of you to take a few minutes and just sort of uh, answer these questions. Not only does it help us uh, learn more about you and uh, how we can make programming for you, it also is, uh, is excellent um, data for us to be able to apply for grants and afford to keep our festival free. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. And you can support Bridget, um, Nell, and Tabitha by buying their books buy their books at your local indie bookstore, or you can also go to Liquake's bookshelf at bookshop.org. Just uh, search Liquake, and we have a shelf of books of all the authors in the festival this year. We also ask for your support of the Liquake organization during these times to allow us to continue bringing you events for free. Even Netflix costs money. So if you believe in keeping literature a key component of San Francisco's cultural landscape, please consider dropping us a few dollars. Every bit helps. We accept donations on Venmo at Liquake, on PayPal at info at liquake.org, or you can go directly to our website at liquake.org. So let's get on with the show. Today, we celebrate Bridget's newest book, She Votes, How U.S. Women Won Suffrage and What Happened Next published this August from Chronicle Books, based right here in San Francisco. The reviews are pouring in, Publishers Weekly calls it a vibrant and witty chronicle of women's rights in America. Book list says, in a time when women's suffrage histories are finally in abundance, Quinn's illustrated compendium stands out with language that pulls no punches. And the local paper here, the San Francisco Chronicle, says she votes is accessible, witty, and fun. From the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation to the first women to wear pants on the Senate floor, she votes presents a lively and colorful intersectional story of the women who won suffrage and those who have continued to raise their voices for equality ever since. In honor of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, this book also features illustrations by 100 women artists, and hopefully we'll see some of those today. Along to discuss this book with Bridget are Tabitha Soren and Nell Irvin Painter, who provided its introduction. Tabitha Soren is an artist and Peabody award-winning journalist, best known for covering the 1992 and 1996 presidential elections for MTV and NBC News. More recently, as an artist, her work has been collected by many museums, including the John Paul Getty Museum, LACMA, and Harvard Art Museums. Nell Irvin Painter is a leading historian of the United States. She has such a CV, it's insane. I'm sorry, I had to truncate it a little bit, but uh, go to her website to see all the stuff she's done. She is currently the Edwards Professor of American History at Princeton University, and she earned a doctorate in history from Harvard University. She has served on numerous editorial boards and as an officer of many professional organizations, including the American Historical Association, the American Antiquarian Society, the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History, and the Association of Black Women Historians. She is the author of seven books, I believe that's correct, most recently, The History of White People. Uh, so Bridget Quinn, uh, uh, a favorite here at Liquake, she lives right here in San Francisco. In addition to her new book, She Votes How U.S. Women Won Suffrage and What Happened Next, Bridget is author of the award-winning Broad Strokes, 15 Women Who Made Art and Made History in That Order. Broad Strokes was an Amazon pick for best art and photography books, and it, uh, 
the two, uh, 2018 Amelia Bloomer list selection of recommended feminist literature from the American Library Association. So Tabitha is right here in Berkeley. Um, Bridget is in San Francisco and Nell is speaking to us from New York State. So please welcome Bridget, Nell and Tabitha. Yay. Thank you so much, Jack. I like seeing Allen Ginsberg over your shoulder there. That's a nice um, San Francisco touch. I just have to say um, that I'm thrilled to be here with two of my favorite women and artists and thinkers and speakers, of course. And I need to say that Nell's most recent book is uh, Old in Art School, which I reviewed for the Chronicle and loved um, because in addition to having a PhD from Harvard, she has an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and that is why we bow to know. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, you guys. I'm just thrilled to be in conversation with you. There's already a uh, comment in the Q&A section about Nell's book saying that I loved Old in Art School it's from Julie. She said, so glad you're here tonight. But now you got to hit the little button that unmutes you. I didn't say anything. I just uh, waited. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought I saw a little red mark. Anyway, um, we're here. I wasn't saying, yeah. <laughs> we're gathered to talk about Bridget's new book. It's called She Votes. And it's really about American women's battles and accomplishments in the too long slog toward equality. But if I'm doing my math right, Bridget, I, it seems like you would be writing this book right after the first women presidential nominee lost to someone who many people, even his supporters, felt was not as qualified, not as educated, not as experienced, well-spoken, wasn't as much of a policy person or international relations expert, mm -hmm. yet he still became president. Well, um, he wasn't a woman, so there's that. <laughs> so did any of that, of what, I mean, that felt to me like such misogyny at the ballot box. Did any of that fuel this book? Oh, definitely. I mean, well, first of all, um, you know, the moment, so Broad Strokes, which was about, was about women artists, came out right after that election. And I thought the book is sunk because I was so hopeful that there would be this renewed interest in feminism when we had the first woman president in the United States. And then when she wasn't elected, I thought, okay, I'm screwed. But instead what happened was that there was really a revival of interest in feminism and women's history. And for, for and that helped um, people be interested in women artists, women artists in history and broad strokes. But it was really being at the Women's March on Washington in 2017, um, the day after the inauguration, where I thought, you know, there's really something to um, history and art in the United States and the struggle for women's rights. And part of that was just, first of all, the Women's March itself was almost like an art action with all the knit pussy hats and the signs, the art was amazing. There was, I mean, there was even, you know, reproductions of art, Judith severing the head of Holofernes, for example, among other things, um, and just very witty banners and just a real sense of, um, of you know, artistic and, and political um, action. And that's what kind of made me excited to write a book about both the history of women's rights in the United States, but using art as a lens for that. Right, so She Votes is a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, but it does so by sort of telling the lesser known stories of what happened along the way. Now, as we discussed, you're both a historian and an artist, and you wrote in the She Votes forward that women's suffrage is the foundation of, the women's, of women's rights, but that too many myths swirl around something so vital to equality. Um, what, do, what do you think are the most important misconceptions that we should clear up about working for the right to vote? Oh dear, well, as I, um, I'm speaking to you from the Adirondacks uh, in Northern New York State and Aquasine and Mohawk land. Uh, and one of the things I love about Bridget's book is that she clears up one of the founding myths that uh, women's rights in the United States started 
with Seneca Falls, she goes back to the Native American women, Native American women from right where I am sitting, who uh, took their rights for granted and also inspired um, uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton because they were also in upstate New York. So upstate New York plays a pivotal role in this, this story. So that's the first thing that needs to be cleared up that it didn't all just start at Seneca Falls with white women. Why uh, do you think we know so little? Because, well, partly because we know so little about the history of Native Americans. Uh, the idea that it all started in 1776 or it all started with European founding, uh, the commonplace that we're all immigrants. Well, we're not all immigrants. And the Native people have time and again been overlooked. And you could say that's racism. It's not exactly the same as racism, but it's the same kind of othering and disappearing that we associate with racism. Bridget, do you feel like the more we know about hard, how hard it was for women to get the right to vote, the more it will spur contemporary women to vote? I mean, Yes, I hope that's true. I also hope that just looking at our situation now, that that in itself will spur women to vote. Um, I do think, and this is from um, you know Native American history as well, or Native history is better said, um, that the past is something we need to know to look toward the future. And for example, if the founding fathers, so-called, when they had looked to what we call the Iroquois Confederacy uh, in mainstream history books, better said the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, when they looked to that model for the model of the United States, if they'd also looked to the gender models, um, you know, imagine what might have happened. Imagine how different it might have been when in Haudenosaunee culture, women could own their own property, when they had control over their own bodies, when they actually voted within their own society. If those things had been part of the American um, framework from the beginning, how different America could be. Um, and I think when you know those things about the past, it just makes it feel um, you know, more vital that we bring it to life in the present and in the future. So I do hope so. I want to quickly say also one of the reasons I think that we don't know about the origins of, you know, women's rights um, so well is that A, it's not taught, and B, the people who told the story first were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they wrote a history of the women's suffrage movement centering themselves and centering uh, Seneca Falls. So that's another reason why it's really important that we tell stories from the past because you have to, you have to control the narrative or yeah. it, takes, it takes over. Exactly. Um, would you like to read a passage from the book for us? Sure. I'm, I, I actually picked something out um, to read today. Very short. Nobody panic. Um, <laughs> just because it's on my mind and it might be on your mind too. Um, and actually, if it's okay, I'm gonna share, um, share an image while I do that. Uh, let's see, can I share a screen? Oh yeah, there we go. There's the book, Obvi. It was live television, anything could happen. There she stood, right hand raised, taking the oath, saying she would tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Like millions of other people glued to televisions across the country, I could not look away. It was easy to see she didn't want to be there with cameras recording her from every angle and a bank of senators staring down at her. She had some difficult things to relay about the Supreme Court nominee, sexual and coercive things, one would assume extremely damaging things. She chose her words with careful deliberation, deliberation. None of it seemed to matter. Because nearly 30 years later, I sat glued to a different screen, watching a different woman professor make, a, make similar claims about another Supreme Court nominee in front of a familiar panel of senators. In both cases, the nominee was approved and his eloquent female accuser called a liar then publicly shamed. Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, 1991, Kristen Blasey Ford, Brett Kavanaugh, 2018. 
history repeating itself in one lifetime. I shouldn't claim the events are totally indistinguishable. Hill was scolded by the senators there to hear her story, accused of erotomania, a theory asking us to believe that she was hot for Thomas and made it all up, and described by journalist David Brock as a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty. Blasey Ford in her turn was relentlessly mocked, including by the President of the United States and memed, shared by at least one Republican Congressman, and months after her testimony still can't return to her job or go home with her family out of fear of violence, by which I mean murder. Public shaming may have changed some, but a familiar viciousness remains. Meanwhile, Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh assumed lifetime appointments to the United States Supreme Court, a position wherein nine Americans are entrusted to sit in judgment of some 330 million more. Why, it's enough to make you want to vote. On the heels of the Thomas mess and on the heels of Kavanaugh too, women came out in droves to elect their own kind. In 1992, 24 women were elected to the House for a total of 47 up from 28 and four to the Senate for a grand total of six. Huzzah, of the 535 congressional and Senate positions in the Capitol, women held 53, nearly a solid 10%. They called it the year of the woman, 10% mm. <laughs> is the year of the woman. So um, yeah, that's maybe a little, a little intense and angry. It's not all that intense, but I'm feeling a little intense and angry, to be quite honest. Now, it might be easy to think of this book as a look back at the people who fought for our right to vote and not associate it with activism now. Um, obviously, that passage makes us think of the Supreme Court hearings going on as we speak. Um, how, how do you think a book like this connects to the resistance that's currently going on in the streets of America this year? Now, oh, sorry. That's um, okay. <laughs> um, it seems to me that knowing that there's a history and knowing that there's company, and knowing the company is widespread and the sentiments uh, of activism run deep, it seems to, at least to me, that's uh, encouraging. Uh, we have to know that the way is long and hard, but this is not the first time. And uh, I, th I think Bridget quotes me at some point in the book saying, activism uh, may not overturn all the evils of society, but at least we can dent them. Yeah, well, voting doesn't overturn all the evils of society either. It uh, seems to me it's about uh, exercising every facet of power one might have access to. Yes. And I think uh, in the recent, recent George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, um, the magnificent outpouring of, uh, of protests and demonstrations, every now and then uh, I would read or hear uh, some young person say, oh, voting doesn't work, only protest works. And uh, our former president, Barack Obama, has famously said that you need both that you need to institutionalize change. You need to institutionalize the policies. And one of the um, outcomes that I would love to see uh, from this year and from this book and from women's suffrage is a focus on policy. So much of our political um, action and thought grows out of passion but politics is about governing. It's about policies and governing. And I think she votes really uh, turns us in that way as because voting is so, sim so uh, central to the actions that are here. That you was so beautifully said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think that Bridget, could you, for those of us who don't know the details, can you explain the difference between what we all learned in school about the Seneca Falls Convention, since we've mentioned it a couple of times, and um, the real lowdown on Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott? Well, I mean, this is when I wish we were in front of live people, because I would like to know who watching learned about the Seneca Falls Convention, because I did not. 
Um, I'm 53. I can't remember when I first learned about Seneca Falls. Uh, I took AP US history and I don't remember it being part of that story. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, but people who do know the story of Seneca Falls generally, speaking very, very generally, know something like in the middle of the 19th century, some sort of grim faced, generally from the photographs, um, white ladies got together, held a meeting and, you know, it took a while, but women got the vote. And, you know, yeah, it was like way more complicated. And um, one, of, one of the misconceptions, first of all, is that Susan B. Anthony, who became, you know, intimately connected to the fight for suffrage, she um, traveled the country for over 50 years as a, a relentless um, advocate for the women's vote. Um, also a very problematic figure in many, many ways, most especially with um, saying some very racist things after the 15th Amendment was ratified and for things that she did to, um, in the sort of Machiavellian pursuit of the women's vote. Um, most people think that Susan B. Anthony was part of Seneca Falls. She was not. She didn't come for several years. Um, it was really begun by... Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who was the famous, famous one of the group. She was a very famous orator, a Quaker. Um, it was really five women, all of them Quakers, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all of them abolitionists. I think that's a really important and interesting, especially now detail. These were women who, you know, were activists already, were activists against slavery at a time when it was difficult to speak out. They um, made many sacrifices as abolitionists. Two of those women had homes that were part of the Underground Railroad, and yet even so could go on to betray Black men, to, um, to mistreat um, the, the words and the name of fellow suffragists who were black, like Sojourner Truth. Um, so I don't know, I may, have, I may have like crossed over the story a little bit, but basically Seneca Falls happens in 1848. The vote, the ratification of the 19th Amendment happens in 1920. And what happens between those two times, those two dates um, is really almost a, um, a, a metaphor for the experience of feminism, race, and the acquisition of liberty in the United States. And it's repeated over and over. And I'm, I hope by knowing the past in a way we can step out of that stream. Mm -hmm. Now you wrote a New York Times bestseller called The History of White People. Yes, that I did. explains how so race was literally invented. Um, yeah. How did its changing meaning affect women's desire to vote or more specifically the, the fight to get the right to vote? Hmm, good question. Uh, by the time uh, women's votes in the United States became, came into view as possible in the early 20th century, that was also a time of intense racialization. I should say that the, the key, key phrase in my book, The History of White People, which is an intellectual history of constructions of whiteness, is that things change. And so by the early 20th century was a time of intense racialization. And at that point in the early 20th century, height of Jim Crow, um, black women uh, like Ida B. Wells Barnett um, had to struggle to be seen as women to, to participate in uh, women's suffrage activities and to participate equally. So uh, race really took over um, suffragism in the early 20th century, making um, voting, women's voting, almost assumed to be something that only had to do with white women, particularly educated white women. So is the, um, the transformation from uh, you know, abolish, abolitionist women whose names we know working uh, on behalf of people of color or women of color getting the vote to um, any sort of intersectional 
aspects of the feminist movement? Or are you saying that, that it actually got harder and further away from treating black yes. women as equals? It got harder and further away. The real breaking moment was 1867. Um, Bridget has mentioned part of this, uh, of a hardening uh, of the commentary um, by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, which really turned uh, deeply racist at that moment because they were so angry that Southern black men whom they considered their racial inferiors were enfranchised and they were not. So um, Bridget has spoken about how in um, Seneca Falls, the women who organized were abolitionists, and this is absolutely true. And um, in the 1840s, 50s, and early 60s, the abolitionist community and the feminist community were one. Uh, it was when black men got the vote and white women did not that things started falling apart and the tensions just continued to grow throughout the last part of the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Bridget, can you tell us any specifics about the disagreements between the um, black suffragists and the white suffragists? Um, wasn't there a disagreement between Alice Paul and Ida B. Wells? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Later, that's uh, 1913, during the, um, the maybe the, the first march on Washington, I don't know if it could be called that or not, but um, Alice Paul was also a Quaker. She was also ostensibly someone, uh, she was definitely radical. She had been radicalized in Britain as part of the suffragette movement there. Um, the suffragettes, even though that sounds diminutive, were the more radical movement. Um, the suffragettes in Britain were, you know, planting bombs and throwing their bodies in front of horses and doing things that were considered sort of unseemly by American women for the most part. And Alice Paul was sort of willing to take those extreme techniques to the United States. So in that sense, she's a radical, but in the sense of um, you know, race relations or in standing arm in arm with black women, she definitely um, was the worst of white feminism. Um, she, uh, I'm gonna just share my screen because I have some, I think, pretty cool uh, images that I can show. But um, Alice Paul had, um, let's see, had the idea of having this, you know, major, I'll just show a few images. Here's Seneca women. <laughs> Seneca Jawea, we can go back. Um, Alice Paul had the idea of having this, um, you know, grand protest for Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, where women from all over the country would come together and uh, press for the women's vote. And women were divvied up, it says here, you know, by, by their occupation, lawyers, nurses, by their schools, Smith College, Vassar, um, and by states. And within states, obviously, you had all kinds of women. And one of the things Alice Paul realized was that there would be Black women marching, including, for example, with Illinois, um, Ida B. Wells, who was, um, you know, one of the most important journalists of the late 19th century and early 20th century. She was an anti-lynching, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Activist. Activist, yeah, I mean, internationally recognized activist, you know, taken, um, brought to England to speak on lynching in the United States, brought awareness of lynching through her book, Southern Horrors to the North. I mean, really brought things to, um, to light that could have been known by anyone, but, but there was an unwillingness to look. She, her, her life was in danger. You couldn't have asked for anyone more um, willing to, to face danger and face down um, power. And Alice Paul told Ida B. Wells and women like her that you should just um, march in the back of the parade. Um, the parade was gigantic. It included something like 500,000 um, onlookers and thousands of women 
um, including the first, oh, there's, oh, there's my picture of Alice Paul, um, including the first black sorority in the United States from Howard University, um, Delta Theta Sigma. Um, Delta Sigma. Oh, Delta Sigma Theta. See, I don't know Greek. <laughs> and, you know, so who were also um, dedicated to suffrage, who were ready to, to, to march in the parade. Um, anyway, short, short story, long story short is Alice Paul, and it's, it's often said if you read sort of mainstream texts, she floated the idea or she suggested. No, she said Black women need to march in the back because we can't conflate suffrage with race. That's a danger to the movement. And Ida B. Wells did what she wanted to and marched with her uh, Illinois contingent. But it's just another one of those moments where, you know, white women in the movement are not aware of all women and are not willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with all women. What about the, how were the Native American women treated in this movement? I mean, obviously their perspective on, uh, uh, matrilineal society versus a patriarchy is different, but once once marches were scheduled and conferences and meetings, were they included at all? Was there anyone who I mean, I'd, um, I'd have had to any have, power? Nell might know more about this than I do. The thing with Native women that's different is that they were living in um, autonomous nations, right? So they could have the vote within their own nations, but those nations weren't necessarily recognized by the federal government or state governments for them to have the vote there, even when the vote was accorded to American women. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So did they not have any interest on their part? I don't know. Sort of uh, no, no. Surely those who were living off the reservation did. We don't know, but... Um, Native people who were on the reservation only um, step by se step got recognized as U.S. citizens right. over the 20th century. So um, they did not get the vote in 1920 yeah. is the point. Right. Got it. Uh, but while we, before we leave the uh, suffrage um, uh, parades, I have to point out that Inez Mulholland, who uh, was famous for being very beautiful and young and riding a white horse, uh, was from right around up here where I am. I didn't uh, know that. Rondacks, yeah. And she has a historical marker in Lewis, which is a town uh, next to where I am. So she's a local celebrity. Up here. Ah, I didn't know that. I mean, a great story about Inez Mulholland is, yeah, she's, she was sort of the, the, the face of the parade because she rode this white horse and she had this long, long hair and she was very beautiful. She was also a lawyer. <laughs> and she um, was a very militant um, activist for suffrage and in fact died of exhaustion um, after collapsing on stage from promoting women's suffrage. I, I went to a, uh a talk or a virtual talk at the George Eastman History of Photography Museum. And they pulled out around the 19th Amendment anniversary, whatever the day was, the day your book came out. And they pulled out from their collection all the photographs that they own from this time. And I was really struck by the attire. I, I, don't, I don't know if, it's a, if I am talking about the exact same parade, but a lot of the women, I guess it was in the winter time, and they dressed so witchy. They had these giant hoods and it, it, you know, I was wondering if that was just, you know, the sartorial uh, fashion of the day or if it was a deliberate sort of, I'm going to hex you kind of uh, <laughs> mm, attitude. I've never the heard curators this. curators seemed to think it was very, it was set up to be intimidating. Well, many of them were in costume, I'll say that. So it could have been part of that, but um, some of the women there wore Greek togas as part of a court of sort of Greco tableau. And imagine how cold that would be. My God, yeah. it was a cold day. Wow. Do any of the stories in your book take place in San Francisco, Bridget? Uh, yeah, a few do. I, I hope I can show one of those pictures. <laughs> um, well, first of all, basketball is invented in the 1890s. And the first I think 1891 it's invented and the first women's collegiate basketball game is between Stanford and Berkeley. Um, Stanford won um, I, and the score was something like 
I could have this wrong, you guys, but it's something like three to two. Um, and only women were allowed in Kizar Stadium um, because men weren't supposed to see women running up and down in sweaters. <laughs> So, um, and I think that the local newspaper, the headline was something like, um, something like Amazon maidens in sweaters, <laughs> brown, something, something, something. <laughs> and some men tried to sneak in, um, and were beaten off by with uh, women with sticks. That's how I remember the story at any rate. Um, let me see if I can. Well, I should probably just let you continue on. It's so it's so hard to change. Well, I don't know. I kind of can't resist um, showing this one because Linda Nochlin, who is sort of the um, the godmother of feminist art history, gave a very important talk to the um, College Art Association in San Francisco in the early 70s, where she explained how it is that truly there is a difference between the way women are depicted and understood in art and the way men are depicted and understood in art. And this is a real thing. And she used as her example um, a demi-porn image from the 19th century by my apples and she had a model from Vassar pose with a, a tray called buy my bananas and um art history was made that day <laughs> so um that's important that happened in San Francisco Geraldine Ferraro accepted the 1984 nomination to be vice president of the United States um, in San Francisco. What else? I don't know. There's been a lot. I don't know. I mean, the occupation of Alcatraz, which, which, polit or, you know, a wonderful, uh, I think a, li a lino cut. Uh, oh, isn't that fantastic? Yeah. yeah by Anna Bronis, who's a Washington state artist. Um, well, so the art in the book is coming up. Why don't we talk about that? Um, let me ask now first though, why did you like the idea of including art in what could seem or be considered a history book? Well, for one thing, I can no longer think narrative. I can no longer th think text without images. That's how I think now. And one of the reasons that I went to art school in the first place was for the freedom to be passionate uh, as you can be in art. I'm thinking of visual art, but that's also true in performance art and theater and dance and music as well. But um, the passion that comes through in the artwork uh, in this book is, is really delightful. And I, I also have to mention another of my neighbors, I won't tell you her name, just that um, she is a gorilla girl. Oh. <laughs> and, the Gorilla Girls uh, appear here who have made a tremendous difference in how we understand um, value in art and excellence in art. I'm, uh, I'm the chair of the board of uh, McDowell, the artist residency, and we're talking about diversity and inclusion. And one of the issues that comes up in a central way is the question of excellence because McDowell says the sole criterion for inclusion is excellence. And now we have to think, especially as we look at, at how exclusionary history of excellence has been, how do we define excellence? And so often excellence has defined women out. Your book um, defines women in, in uh, a wonderfully wholehearted way. Bridget, can you uh, summarize who the Gritta Girls are, just for those uh, who are listening who might not know their posters or their the yeah. that they well, move us with? Yeah, I wish I had um, some of the uh, pictures from the book because I think they're so fantastic. But the Gorilla Girls were a group of women artists in New York City, originally the, the core original group in the early 1980s who saw that um, shows were not including women, museum shows and, and gallery exhibitions, surprise. Um, there has been literally no change um, in the statistics to now, or very, very little when there is. Um, and they decided that they needed to do something to, to challenge 
the status quo. And the way they came up with challenging it was one, to use statistics, two, to use art, and three, to use masks. Because of course, if they were to speak out, they could um, get the, uh, the backlash. Um, against them and their careers. So uh, it, the story goes, it could be a little bit apocryphal that they were having this meeting and they were talking loudly. Oh, thank you, woo, <laughs> the Gorilla Girls. Um, <laughs> that they said they would be like gorilla soldiers, you know, like wear masks and someone wrote gorilla, but they wrote gorilla spelled like a gorilla. And so uh, the animal, and so someone went to, you know, one of the, the costume shops and bought gorilla masks. And then it worked really well as a kind of both, they were kind of fierce looking, but then they would wear, you know, pearls or fishnet stockings or whatever um, when they went out in public. So they would assume the names of women artists of the past in a way to reinsert their legacy into the present because that's a huge part of artistic um, memory, value, everything is to be remembered. So they would use those names from the past and then they would create these broadsides originally. They do a lot of different things now that would have statistics like um, you know, uh, the most famous one is, um, do you have, do you have to be naked? Do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum of Art? Yes. Yes. Um, and then something like 85% of the, uh, nudes in the Metropolitan Museum of Art are of women. And there are only 5% by women, paintings by women. They really um, have yeah. just very specifically, uh, analyze the history of art as the history of power instead yes. of it being about, it's not just about gender, it's about money and uh, who's on the boards of the museums who are making the decisions, how are you pleasing the collectors? And, and you know, there are parts of that, in addition to the backlash, it could also be seen as a way to, you know, pivot and, and use it to benefit your career if you're getting this attention for this activism. So the gorilla masks were mm. um, both ways. And they've really, in the past really few years, um, I wouldn't say pivoted, but have begun to embrace, you know, speaking out for artists of color, including in the film business um, and in other places in the cultural world in the United States. I just want to quickly say about Nell and her work that um, as a young art history student, um, I came across her biography of Sojourner Truth and was, I had a kind of a liberation moment, which is that um, Nell kind of deconstructs uh, Sojourner Truth's carte de visite photos that she uses as kind of um, calling cards, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And these very famous images of truth that are so iconic in American history and shows how she presented her own image and how she was in control of how she presented herself in the world. And it really made me excited as a sort of young art historian who was going to leave the field that you could use art, the visual arts, to tell a story from the past. And it didn't have to be done in this sort of connoisseurship way, this art historical way. It could be done in a way of, of you know, explaining the past. Yeah. I was really inspired by that. Good, thank you. And so do you know more about that now? It like, started me into art. I, that was the first time I could really concentrate it on images. So Journal of Truth did not read and write. Uh, so her most famous utterance about um, the rhetorical question about whether or not she's a woman, which I will not repeat, and, but only say she did not say it. Don't you repeat it either, people. <laughs> <laughs> and Bridget treats it right, yeah. How did uh, we get that impression? That's too long a story to okay. tell here. But what did she actually uh, say? Uh, that also is too long a story to tell here. Read the book, read my book or Nell's book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that she did not read or write, so she did not record herself uh, in words. And um, the, uh, the famous quote, which she actually did not say, is part of the, the, um, the weakness of not being your own writer. Mm -hmm. But she, did, she was her own um, crafter of um, photography, of photographic images. She did control those. She went to studios and decided how she wanted to sit and be shown. And so if I wanted to get anywhere at understanding Sojourner Truth, um, her, not only her self-fashioning, but some sense of herself, I had to learn how to deal with the rhetoric of the image, so to speak, uh, which meant uh, teaching myself 
um, art history and art criticism. Luckily, Princeton has a fantastic um, library of uh, art history. So I had that at hand and I was absolutely entranced. And that's how I started down the road to imagery. Do we know anything about how Sojourner Truth decided that art plays a role in whose story is remembered and whose story is forgotten? Well, we certainly know um, that she was a very canny um, um, self-fashioner. She knew how she wanted to be known. So she dictated um, an autobiography early on and her first forays into talking about uh, anti-slavery was as she was selling her book. So she made her living by talking and by selling um, versions of herself. And in the 1860s, carte de visite uh, were invented and became very widely circulated. She was not the only person who used it. And she would sell them. She said, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And so she was selling herself as she wanted to be seen. Um, yeah. When you, that quote reminds me of your self-portrait in Bridget's book now. Yeah. Um, it's from 2015, I believe, and That's it looks right. to me like a charcoal drawing. Do uh, yes, yes. play a big uh, role in your practice? I do a lot of self-portraits just because I'm a really handy uh, motif and I don't have strong feelings about how I look. Uh, if I were to use another model, I would always have in my mind whether or not the model is going to uh, approve of how I capture that person. Um, I had a show last year at Harvard um, that was about self-portraiture. It's on my website, www.nellpainter.com. And I haven't made self-portraits this year, that is in 2020. Um, my current work in my progress actually is based on um, a Holocaust, um, Holocaust record. But before that, uh, which is currently at the Newark uh, Museum of Art, is an artist book called uh, From Slavery to Freedom. And it's about the uh, demonstrations of this spring and summer. And then before that, be before COVID, but in this calendar year, uh, I did uh, American Whiteness Since Trump, which is going up um, on the online uh, gallery of uh, James Fuentes uh, Gallery. And that will be circulating soon. I don't have the uh, press release yet. That's exciting. Really um, exciting. Bridget, I want you to tell us about the story about the suffragist, suffragist statue. But before I do, I should remind people that we are going to take questions from people watching and we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions for Nell or Bridget or even myself, um, we're happy to answer almost anything, uh, just write it in the Q&A <laughs> section um, of the uh, Facebook Live. So Bridget, tell me about the suffragist statue and maybe if it's not too much trouble, you could even uh, show a picture. I feel like I have to show a picture. I know it's disjointed to keep going back and forth, but um, it's, it's odd and I feel like worth seeing. Um, it's also just, a it's, it is one of those stories of like things being lost and found, which I think is always fascinating in history. Um, so shortly after women got, oh, hold on a second, got the, um, the, the vote in 1920, um, uh, one of the suffragist artists of which there were many, including Mary Cassatt, for example, um, her name was Adelaide Johnson. She was um, a sculptor who decided that she would use her life savings to create a monument to the founders of the women's suffrage movement um, and, and did. It's very large. It weighs, you know, many, many tons, I think seven tons, something like that. Um, and this is actually not a great image because it's difficult to see, but 
there are three busts and it end, it ends here and then it's this just giant marble slab and it is Elizabeth Cady, or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony. And then there's this kind of ghostly headstone in the back. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of, I guess it's a legend. I don't know if it's true. Nell might know if this is mm -hmm. actually true or not, but that that fourth ghostly form was for the first woman president. And that whenever that happened, uh, that person was supposed to be mm. enshrined in the, in the portrait monument. And the portrait monument also had this inscription that was, um, you know, very uh, heartfelt, but, but um, maybe a little overblown language that came from Lucretia Ma or from Elizabeth Cady Stanton's and Susan B. Anthony's um, women's suffrage history about women now arisen, a force to be reckoned with. And um, it was dedicated in 1921 on Susan B. Anthony's, on the centennial of her birthday, she had died many years before, um, in the Capitol building and um, with like a giant pageant and a marine band and banners and costumes, more of the same. And it was accepted by Congress. And the next day they chipped off the inscription because it was considered uh, offensive and they put it in the Capitol crypt below, it was intended for the rotunda of the Capitol and they put it in the Capitol crypt um, below the Capitol building um, where the crypt was intended originally as all crypts are to hold remains. It was originally intended to hold the remains of George Washington, it never did. And eventually over time it became basically a storage closet. So, um, <laughs> Over time, the portrait monument was kind of forgotten about. It was down there literally with brooms and mops and whatever else. Uh, and then in the 1990s, uh, in the 60s, the crypt was kind of refurbished to become a tourist area. Um, but the statue was just one of many sort of detritus of things that were around. And it was rediscovered by a woman um, named Karen Stazer who was beginning uh, the Women's History Museum. And she, decided it had to be in the rotunda. So um, that year of the woman that I spoke of, the 10% uh, representation by women in Congress um, in the 90s did lead eventually to the portrait monument coming into the rotunda. And it was the first image of women, living women to be in the rotunda, except for a painting of Pocahontas. Um, you'll notice that these are three white women. Sojourner Truth was not included, even though she's of the same era. And that was remarked at the time. And a, a bust of Sojourner Truth was commissioned and was dedicated by Michelle Obama at last. And where is that? That is in Emancipation Hall, um, which is where um, most of the statues that were originally in the rotunda as part of the representation of states. Each state gets two representatives. There are very few women, surprise. Um, many of them are in Emancipation Hall. Now there's also a bust of Susan B. Anthony. Um, Jeanette Rankin is there, who's the Montana um, state dedication, but also was a suffragist. Um, and is this, uh, is this statue still in the rotunda? It is. It would be very, very hard to move. I mean, it took two days to move it from, and tens of thousands of dollars, all privately raised money, to move it from the crypt into the rotunda. So if they want to move it out again, it's going to take real, real uh, intention and effort and money. Good God. It's a very That's strange sculpture. I can imagine a picture of, or a, a carving of Hillary Clinton, you know, know right? that happened four <laughs> years ago, right in that, you know, those three women and then her. That, that it would be wild. I mean, it could still happen. I think I have hope that. Oh Kamala yeah, I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I just think. No, no, I mean, I have hope imminently. Yeah. I'm saying I have hope that Kamala Harris could be our next. Well, then we- Speaking for myself. At least it would all be white women then. Yeah. Um, Bridget, do you think there are cycles to who gets to play a role in history? I mean, are there, it, it seems like Sacagawea was somebody who was rediscovered, that she was known and then unknown and known. She wasn't known in her lifetime. She was rediscovered 
yeah, in 1905 or 1902 by, um, a, a, so, so yes, there are cycles. Um, I'm working on a book right now about women painters during the French Revolution. And one of the most disturbing parts of the story is that they were powerful, recognized, successful, active, and then forgotten. <laughs> Um, you can see it in the Artemisia Gentileschi show that's at the National Gallery in London right now. Artemisia Gentileschi was, you know, very successful um, painter who ran her own atelier, et cetera, et cetera, and was, her work was completely folded into the work of her father for centuries. So um, that definitely happens. And it's, to me, I feel like that's what a lot of my work is about is saying um, it, it is, women have had power, agency, uh, productivity, everything in the past, and it's been lost to them and it could be lost to us, I believe. Um, but for, to go back to Sacagawea, uh, yeah, that was maybe one of the most surprising stories I learned in researching the book, which is that, you know, Sacagawea was um, a teenager, something like 16 years old when she was part of the core of discovery with Lewis and Clark. Um, a young mother, she had just had a baby two months before she walked 7,000 miles with the baby <laughs> to, the, to the Oregon coast and uh, over the Continental Divide and back again. Um, but she was just another member of the Corps during a time when the great man theory of history or whatever you want to call it, there was only Lewis and Clark. There was not York. There was not um, Sacagawea. They weren't, there were not these other men of the expedition, really. So it was a, a shock and a surprise in 1902 when a suffragist and novelist named Ava Emery Dye in Oregon sort of discovered her story in the Lewis and Clark journals and then wrote a book that centers her story for a lot of reasons, not least of which is that she was a mother. That was one of the big um, propaganda tools against women voting was that mothers would abandon their children because they couldn't do two things at once. You couldn't vote and, and uh, have a child. Sacagawea did quite a few things with a child. <laughs> um, but she also voted in Oregon um, when Lewis and Clark had a, a, a vote to see where they should have their winter camp in 1805, 1806. Um, so she was the perfect symbol for suffragists in Oregon, but she also became this enduring symbol for American women, because there are so few women in American history to look to as these sort of heroic figures. Um, I mean, it's complicated and not without its difficult aspects, kind of appropriating a story for certain westward expansion um, narratives. But at the same time, it's a pretty amazing thing that someone who was forgotten for 100 years is now a central figure in American history, I think. I agree completely. And I've got some questions in the Q&A that I'm about to get to. But uh, before we uh, open it up, I would like to just ask you and Nell each one question, um, one final question. Nell, you've written all these history books. Was there anything in this book of Bridget's that you didn't know? <laughs> Oh, there was a great deal I didn't what? know. Where to start? All right. Really? Well, what's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, new bit of knowledge that uh, well, you want to thank Bridget for? Oh dear! Oh dear! Well, this is really. I mean, there really, really was a lot. Um, but I think what I like. Uh, let me not try to chronicle my ignorance because. Um, <laughs> So much. She told it that way. I mean, I it, was, it was the Native women's volleyball. Was that basketball? It, basketball. Yeah, I didn't know. I mean, there were many, many things I didn't know, but that was particularly true. That's one of my favorite one stories. Tell us that story, Bridget. Let me tell you three things I love yeah. about. Okay. One is that I love the voice. It's informative, but it's also funny. I love the art. Um, all um, to me, new art, and um, it's both um, engaged art, but it's art that holds the eye and, and delights the eye. And then the breadth of what's considered women's, I mean, she starts with votes for women, but it's about 
women's um, power in the public sphere. Bridget, do you want to tell us the Native American women's basketball story and then admit to, you know, maybe the, the most shocking thing you learned in writing the book? Well, I'll just tell the quickest, quickest, quickest story about the women's basketball team is the one thing I love about being an author is the prerogative to tell whatever story I feel like. Yeah. And I just seize that. Yeah. yeah. So um, it was a story I grew up with because I grew up in Montana. A couple of my brothers hunted with the descendants of this women's basketball team from Fort Shaw, a native women's team from the Fort Shaw Indian School, as it was called. And um, my mom had been a basketball player in the 40s, and she had heard the legends of this incredible women's team. So I had gone searching for the story and found an amazing book about the team. Um, but the basic story is just that Native women, Plains tribes, Native, uh, Plains tribes, women played ball games. That was part of the culture. And so when basketball was introduced, it made total sense to Native women that they would be good at it, competitive, play hard. Um, and in these schools, it became a place where they could have part of their own culture in a setting where their culture was being, you know, viciously eradicated. So even though it wasn't the same ball game, it was a way to play as a team. Uh, kind of traditional activity. Um, and the Fort Shaw women's team were so good from this tiny, tiny town that they beat all the Montana teams, college teams, men's teams, and became well known enough that they were invited to the St. Louis uh, World's Fair in the early 20th century, where they beat all the teams there and eventually beat the, um, the entire state of Missouri created an all-star team to take them on and they beat them three out of three games. So they were given a trophy saying that they were the world champions of basketball. So the first world champions of basketball were native women from Montana. That's the whole, that's most of the story, but Amazing. it's a great story. Now, what was the other part of that? Um, I was what was the most shocking thing you learned in writing the book? Oh, I don't know. There's so many things, right? But um, the things are, they're just small, but they, they are, uh, well, the Sacagawea thing blew my mind because I grew up in a place where she is everywhere. There are statues, schools named after Sacagawea, you know, springs, um, art, so much artwork. To know that it was, that her legacy had been recovered, you know, in the 20th century was really surprising to me. But it's smaller things. I mean, I remembered when women first wore pants on the Senate floor and being so irritated because it was like 1994. It was probably after you wrote the Sojourner Truth book, no? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, but, but still, you know, within my memory, but I didn't realize that it was like 2008 or 2009 before women senators could use the Senate swimming pool. Swimming pool. And for some reason that just like set me off. Yeah. I know. Why were they allowed? because male senators like to swim in the nude. So they decided it had to be. Also, there are no women's bathrooms in the Senate. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know, but for a long time, there were none. They had to go to another building, which in Washington DC means super hot in the summer and freezing in the winter. So if you don't believe that there's like an institutional, <laughs> institutionalized misogyny, there is. Yeah, there is. So this, this question is from Alexandra, and she wants to know, um, what would you paint on a sign for this Saturday's Women's March for either of you? Oh, boy. I, there's only one thing to say, vote. Vote, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, that's been said so many times that I, I feel like we're turning into nags about that. Yeah. Uh, I think I would say we're still here and um, we're tough and maybe even fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like fuck you. <laughs> I have to say there was something satisfying at the Women's March seeing multiple versions of Judas uh, severing the head of Holofernes, which you can look I, up. If you don't know. Yeah. It was yeah. it was satisfying because that's how you that's how I felt. Like I wanted yeah. 
You know, I say in the beginning of She Votes that for the first time, I suddenly understood in a completely different way the story of Charlotte Corday um, murdering uh, Marat, the, um, the French revolutionary in his bathtub, that mm. I, I got it. It wasn't just a story. Like she saw what was at stake and took up arms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So our next question is a little bit long, so I'm gonna put my glasses on to read it. Julie Seiler, I think I'm pronouncing that. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I know who that is. <laughs> yes, this is a question for both Bridget and Nell. It seems as if women's rights have taken a big step back over the past four years, and the addition of Amy Conan Barrett could particularly push back the right to reproductive choice. What lessons can we learn from the women's suffrage movement about how to fight back? I want to say that Julie Seiler is a very good writer <laughs> and his, historical writer as well. No, yeah. go ahead. He knows the answer. <laughs> um, I think that what we will have learned um, two things right now that power grows from below and that we have to pay attention to local power local offices, uh, state and local. We can't just concentrate on the national because um, state and local is where the laws and the practices that deal with women's bodies, that's where that kind of legislation and enforcement comes from. Uh, and the second thing is that um, we need to make, well, it's the first thing really, that we need to make ties between how we think about what's public and how we think about what's private and attend to that every day. Thanks. Um, our final question is from Francine Radford. Sojourner Truth's skill in deploying her visual image reminds me of Frederick Douglass. I saw an exhibit at the Museum of African American History in Boston that focused on how many photos he had taken of him and the use he made of them. Are there others who were similarly attuned to the power of their images in this era? And was Douglass inspired by truth? Oh, I want Nell to answer this. Well, um, there were many. The carte de visite was a very widespread practice. And uh, one of the most famous images that's a carte de visite is um, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, in, uh, not Tammany Hall, where is Abraham Lincoln? The Cooper Union, the Cooper Union, Abraham Lincoln. That's probably the most famous image of Abraham Lincoln. And it's the same, uh, the same technique that Sojourner Truth used. Um, so they were not singular in American public discourse in using photography, but I think they were, I'm pretty sure I'm right, that they were the only African Americans who were able to deploy photography so abundantly. And part of that has to do with our collecting uh, our since their lifetimes and even uh, recently. But it's said now that uh, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed uh, 19th century American. And that's something that simply could not have been said uh, probably five years ago. I think we've only come around to realizing that. Um, so um, I, I wish others, I mean, we do have other photographs of African American subjects but we don't have the abundance that we have with uh, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. I mean, I immediately think about the artist Edmonia Lewis, yes, um, who was African American and Native American and was very thoughtful and clear in how she presented herself as basically a European artist. Mm -hmm. um, she was living in Rome, um, a way of, of assuming the mantle of artistry that other artists of all kinds um, had and definitely not as widely collected or distributed or any of those things, but very canny use of image. Yeah. Well, I think that's really a good place to stop. The book is She Votes, it's fantastic. We haven't done justice to the artwork in it today. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's basically a combination art 
catalog as well as a, uh, an eye-opening, sassy history book. Um, well said. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful, you guys. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Tabitha, Nell, Bridget. Um, thank you for your time and sharing all this today. And everyone watching, go buy their books. Mm -hmm. Buy their books. She votes. Nobody got a book tour this year. So this is your way to support the people who write books. So thanks for tuning. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see you uh, at another Liquid event, hopefully. Thanks, Jack, and happy birthday. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nell. Thank you, Tabitha, so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.